Hello, in this video we are talking about conservation of energy, one of the most fundamental ideas in all of physics and one of the most useful tools for solving physics problems. Uh, believe it or not, if you find a physics problem you can solve with conservation of energy, it tends to make life a whole lot easier. So we're going to talk about how to do that. So we're really talking about here about mechanical energy, which, uh, well, it's kinetic and potential energy is what it is. So there's a couple types of energy that we want to know about and are going to use. Kinetic energy is energy that has to do with a moving thing. If a thing is moving, it's got kinetic energy. In terms of potential energy, there's really two main types that we're going to talk about for now, and they're gravitational potential and elastic potential. So potential energy means stored energy. It does kind of really mean if I'm holding something up in the air, potentially, if I let it go and let it fall, some energy stuff would happen, right? So it's kind of, it's officially really uh, stored energy, um, very officially gravitational potential energy is energy stored by a gravitational field because of where a thing is in a gravitational field. Basically, gravitational potential energy is energy because something is up off the ground. That's how we're using it. That if you're holding something up in the air, you could let it go, gravity would pull it down, and so some energy would happen. Similar idea uh, in, in terms of stored energy is elastic potential energy. Uh, this is another way you can store energy is with something stretchy, like an elastic material, like a spring is the one we'll see most often, or a rubber band. Uh, you know, pull a rubber band, stretch a rubber band, you've stored some energy inside the rubber band, let it go, it'll go flying across the room. So those are our types of mechanical energy. Energy is a scalar, so it's not a vector. We don't need to worry about direction. There is no direction for energy. Doesn't mean that we'll never deal with negatives with this stuff, right? Scalars can be negative, um, but we don't have direction. So these are scalars. We measure energy in joules. And here are the base units of a joule. With some of the equations we're about to look at, see if you can make sense of why these units work out the way they do. And here they are. These are your data booklet equations for energy. You want to know, as with all of the data booklet, what all this stuff means. So we got equations for kinetic energy, for gravitational potential energy, and for uh, elastic potential energy. All right, so just make sure you know what all these variables are. EK means kinetic energy of a thing, where M is the mass of the thing and V is the speed of the thing. Uh, yeah, it really is kind of speed. You could, it's velocity slash speed. We're going to square it. Uh, and energy is a scalar, so it doesn't really matter if you put it in a negative or a positive. Yeah, but I do one half times M times V of the thing squared. Uh, they also give you this, which is fun. This is a kinetic energy in terms of momentum. So momentum squared over two times M. Uh, this is just a fun, useful one if you happen to know momentum, but like, say, don't know how fast the thing is going. Uh, you can use this. Think about P equals MV. Momentum is M times V. So see if you agree that these are two versions of saying the same thing. Okay, this equation is about gravitational potential energy. And officially, the equation gives us a change. The equation, really, the math, really gives us a change in potential energy. Um... And the change in potential energy depends on a change in height. So if I lift something up, so if I take something from a low position to a high position, lift it up in the air, delta H is positive, so I have a gain. I increase the potential energy of the object. Whereas if I drop a thing or if I let a thing, you know, move a thing to a lower position, um, then I will have a negative change in gravitational potential energy. So this equation is just saying you lift a thing up, you give it more potential energy, you move a thing down, you give it less potential energy. Uh, we're going to talk about a simplified way to use this equation in a second, but uh, there you go. That's gravitational potential energy. And this guy in the data booklet is um, the elastic potential energy, which the IB decides to put an H on because, I don't know. Um, so I think they're doing it because H usually we do with Hooke's Law. In the data booklet, they do FH, I think, for um, like a spring force. The idea being we call that equation Hooke's Law. We don't call this like hook energy, so I don't know what they're getting at here. Uh, but, uh, you know, for whatever reason, they decided to do this. So, okay. 
Anyway, you just want to know that H is like spring related. So this is energy uh, stored in a spring. It's elastic potential energy. And you calculate it with one half times K, the spring constant, which we defined when we did Hooke's law. That's like uh, the stretchiness, the springiness of a spring, really. We measured it in Newtons per meter. And delta X is all one thing. Delta X is really kind of like the change in the length of the spring, or we sometimes say like the compression or uh, extension distance, how far you stretch or pull or stretch or compress the spring is what we're talking about. So the length of the spring itself doesn't matter. It's how far you stretch it or compress it from where it like naturally wants to rest. That's how you're going to store energy. So we'll look at some of these. Um, We'll look at an example of this later on. But those are your equations. Make sure you know what they're saying. All right, so in terms of gravitational potential energy, um, here's the equation you might be more used to and the equation we'll usually use. You just kind of want to know, HL students especially, because we'll have some fun with this later when we start talking about stuff that's like not just, you know, there's a floor where like satellites orbiting and fun stuff like that. But for our normal everyday life, when uh, we're doing energy stuff, this is perfectly good. So uh, we can do an equation like this where we just say potential energy equals MGH, and I can just say a thing has a certain amount of potential energy rather than always talking about the change if I choose a zero. Your choice of zero for potential energy is uh, arbitrary. For these kind of problems, you can just decide where you want to say the ground is, and so you can just say, I'm going to say there's zero potential energy here. So then, in effect, by talking about a change, you're just giving it a value. Um, all right, so long story short, use this equation for normal conservation of energy problems where H is your height above zero, where you're going to define probably the ground or the floor to be a place where there's zero potential energy because it's an arbitrary choice. It really is, um, as far as you're using it here. Um, okay, if you're interested, here's the math of why this is like okay, so feel free to peruse this if you want to uh, math understand a little better what's going on here and kind of the relationship between the change equation, which is the more official one, and the MGH equation, which is a math sloppy but totally useful way to do it in normal problems. Okay, so there's a rule about energy. You've probably heard it. Energy is conserved. The total energy of a system is conserved um, in an isolated system. Sometimes the IB will ask you to describe or define one of these laws, like define the law of conservation of energy, define the law of the conservation of momentum. Just make sure you don't just say the conservation of energy means energy is conserved. You gotta just explain what conserved means and conserved means it doesn't change. You end up with the same amount of energy you started with in your system. As long as it's an isolated system, which would mean like no external forces or anything are adding or taking away energy from your system. That does happen though sometimes. Often that happens where you're adding or taking away energy if there's stuff like friction. How do we deal with that? We have a thing for it. It's a super important thing called work. So if you add energy to a system, if you take energy away from a system, the way we talk about this is we say you do work. You do work if you're putting energy into something or taking energy out of something, which gives us a definition equation. One of the most important equations there is in physics, certainly in IB physics, this is like one of the biggest, biggest, biggest equations you want to know. This is so huge and important. You need to know this. It's so useful. Um, and it's not in the data booklet. That is on purpose because this is such a fundamental definition and rule. You have to know this. They really just want you to know. You're really just supposed to know that this is a thing. Um, this is really one of the most like foundational physics things that there is. Work is change in energy. All right, so change in energy is what we call work. Uh, so work would be measured in joules then because it's a change in energy. Yeah, if I put 10 joules of energy into a system, I did 10 joules of work. Friction takes 30 joules of energy away then we're dealing with 30 joules of work. It would, in fact, there be negative 30 because um, you can have negatives. Okay, so here we can like move this, we can play with this equation. Uh, this is usually, well, often how we'll kind of use this stuff. So just remember, whenever you change, think of it as final minus initial. I'm looking at it before and an after. So 
if there's a change in energy of a thing, I take the energy at the end minus the energy it started with. The difference is the work. That's just what this is saying here. I can also move some stuff around here to get an equation like this. This is usually how we'll set up conservation of energy problems. This is, I find, the most useful way to kind of do it. Um, the idea being, okay, if there's no work done, then I have an isolated system and the initial energy would be equal to the final energy. But if I like come in and push something and I add energy to the system, then I'll end up with more than I started with. The initial energy plus whatever work I do gives me my final energy. Uh, work can be negative though. You, if something takes energy away, this is like a negative value. So if there's something taking energy away, then I think you'll end up with a smaller amount of energy than you started with. Yeah, so that's all saying the same thing. Work is the change in energy. That's what it is. This is between this and power, which we'll do soon. Those two things are the most important things in all of IB physics to know. Okay, like tattoo them on yourself or something. They are, they are really, really, really foundational. And we're going to use this equation, this definition equation, in every single unit that we do. This comes up everywhere. All right, so work is changing energy. All right, so this version of the equation is a way that we really set up these like conservation of energy style problems. It's really useful to do problems this way when you can just say, what happened? What's going on at the beginning? What's going on at the end? And if you can like tally up all the energy, you can set this up and um, find some great success. Here's what you want to do. If you're trying to tackle a problem using conservation of energy, you definitely want to sketch not like a FBD or anything. Um, you just want a sketch of what's happening so you can picture what's happening because you really need to think about what's going on. This is not a process thing. Like most of physics, honestly, it's not really a process thing. It's a think about what's happening and then do some math thing. The thing that will help you that is making a sketch. So look in your mind at what's happening in the beginning and look at what's happening at the end. And we're gonna use a, that picture to help us set up the initial and final energies. So here's the deal. When you look at the initial situation and then you look at the final situation, you really just want to ask yourself these questions. Is there anything moving? Because if the answer is yes, then you have kinetic energy and you're going to figure out how much with one half mv squared. Is there anything like up off of the ground? If that's happening, then you also have potential energy and you're going to figure out how much with like mgh. And is there anything like stretched or compressed or pushed against a spring or something? If that's true, then you have some stored elastic potential energy and you're gonna calculate how much with one half K X squared. Okay, so you really gotta think about like the physical situation that's happening and picture it and decide what types of energy you're dealing with. It is not, this is a really common mistake to watch out for. It's not true that like, because I don't have kinetic energy, therefore I have potential energy. Uh, yeah, that's not a thing. So it's, it's not true that if you don't have one type, you must have the other type. This is how you decide if you have these types of energy. So you really look at the picture and you ask yourself these questions. That's how you have to do it. So you do this for both pictures. You say, here's what types of energy do I have at the beginning? Add them all up to calculate your EI, your initial energy. And then what types of energy do I have at the end? Add them all up and calculate your final energy, which is just the total. Um, if there's work done, you also include that. So if energy's added, you put in a number for work. If energy's taken away, you put in a negative number for work. There is some, uh, we'll do some equations soon for different ways that you can calculate work. Um, sometimes it's just a number we know, but often it's something we got to calculate, which there's ways to do that. So we'll stop there for now. We will do some conservation of energy practice with this method uh, in the next video. See you there.